rising energy costs and uh, so forth. So in this graph, we'll see that um, the cost of energy is a significant portion of total production costs for uh, uh, some sectors and industries, particularly the energy intensive sectors. In this graph, we see the cost of energy to manufacturing industries as a percentage of total production costs. Uh, it is somewhat outdated, it's from 2005, but I think it still illustrates the point. So for example, if we look at cement manufacturing, over 35% of cement manufacturing's uh, total production costs comprises of energy costs. Aluminum is over 15%, pulp and paper at about 15%, iron and steel a little under 15%. So a significant portion of their total cost is comprised of energy costs. And what companies should be asking is, do they know what percentage of total production costs are energy costs and how this has been trending in the past couple of years? Most likely, it's safe to assume that the trend has been an upward trend for many different industries and sectors. So in terms of energy use worldwide, what in the past has been, uh, we've been noticing is that many organizations uh, who don't have an energy management system in place, um, basically their energy use uh, continues to rise over time. It's because they have, uh, they don't have any efficiency or their efficiencies have been frozen in time and they notice an increase in their energy consumption year over year. However, when they embed an energy management system, not only are they able to reduce their consumption, but perhaps more importantly, they're able to maintain and sustain the energy savings that they have gained in the past. So energy price instability combined with energy use can have a significant impact on an organization's financial and business performance. Historically, there's been an ad hoc approach to energy management. So companies, they've taken very much a reactive approach. They notice that, okay, their energy consumption and costs, they're going up. What they do is they react to that scenario. So they start doing audits, they cut waste, and they're able to reduce their consumption and costs. But because there's no really persistence and commitment and continuous monitoring, what happens is that over time, the savings that they've accrued over time, they continue, uh, uh, they lose them and their consumption starts to rise again. However, when you have a structured approach and an embedded energy management system, basically a company, they commit to uh, an, a program and then they're able to gain initial savings, and then more importantly, over time, they're able to maintain those savings uh, during, uh, uh, during a certain period of time and not lose those savings because energy management systems, it becomes a part of the company culture. So you have continued, you have persistence, commitment, discipline, continuous monitoring, taking uh, preventative and corrective action, and that does become a part of the company culture. ISO 50001 is an international standard and framework for the man management of energy in any business size. It can apply to small, medium, or large enterprises in the industrial, commercial, institutional, uh, or uh, transportation sectors. And ultimately what this standard aims to do is help an organization's uh, energy performance and help them to improve their energy performance over time with the end result of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and their operational costs. The benefits of an energy management system is that a company is able to gain credible energy and cost savings with little or no capital expenditures. Now, estimates indicate that about 10 to 15 percent of energy cost savings are from non-capital projects through simple process optimization. And these are conservative estimates. An additional 10 to 15% are uh, in terms of uh, energy conservation and, and savings are gained from capital projects. Again, conservative estimates. So uh, in some cases, these uh, savings can even be higher than that. An energy management system, it encourages your supply chain to adopt ISO 50001 in order to become a lower cost and a more competitive supplier as well as a lower emission supplier. 
It enhances your energy security, so it reduces your exposure to energy price fluctuations, and it helps a company basically prepare for the impact that rising energy costs or volatility in terms of energy costs might have on their business performance. It enhances your energy efficiency. It reduces your greenhouse gas emissions and your environmental impact. And ultimately, what it does is it instills uh, a much higher degree of commitment, discipline, accountability, and persistence in terms of your managing your energy system, your consumption, and really managing the savings that you've been able to gain over time. In addition, there are external incentives available from the U.S. Department of Energy and Natural Resources Canada, which I'll talk more about later. So ISO 50001 is very much based on the familiar Plan Do Check Act cycle that's common to a lot of other standards, such as ISO 9001 quality management systems or ISO 14001 environmental management systems. The Plan Do Check Act cycle is a systematic approach to the achievement of continual improvement in an energy management system, which seeks to incorporate effective energy management into daily organizational practices. This involves a clear understanding of efficient energy management, potential improvement areas, the means to implement and evaluate improvements, and directives from top management that repeat the sequential cycle indefinitely. So in the plan stage, the management is responsible for developing a policy, uh, an energy policy, an energy plan, as well as objectives and targets. In the due stage, then it comes to training and raising awareness amongst your employees and staff. So in terms of what is the vision and strategy of the, the company in terms of its energy policy and plan. And more importantly, what role can employees play in terms of reaching the objectives and targets uh, of a particular energy policy and plan? Communication is a key part of it in terms of constant communication as to improve the energy management system. And you have to obviously document all of that as is the case with other ISO standards as well. In the check stage, Monitoring and measuring is key, it's paramount. Uh, there's a saying that says that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. You also have to conduct internal audits to make sure that the management system is functioning properly. And in case if there are any non-conformities, a company needs to examine as to what may be some preventative and corrective actions that they need to take in order to basically get back to uh, the, object, uh, the objective and target that they've set in case it, there's any sort of deviation from them. And then lastly, in the act stage, uh, they have to report all of this progress to management for review to see how the system is progressing, particularly when it comes to the policy, plan, objectives, and targets. Uh, ISO 50001 is compatible with many other ISO management system standards. So as you can see here, there are certain unique elements to ISO 50001 that are very much data-driven. For instance, a company needs to conduct an energy review, they need to have energy performance indicators, an energy baseline, and an energy management. But where there are common elements uh, between ISO 50001 as well as 14000 and 9001, and when there's, where there's overlap, is in particularly when it comes to management commitment, such as roles and responsibilities competence and training, communication, oper operational control, and so forth. ISO 50001-2018 standard is based on the Annex SL, or Structured Layer Framework, and therefore it's easier to integrate it with ISO 9001-2015 and or ISO 14001-2015 standards. The requirements, um, I should say the key requirements of ISO 50001 is, first and foremost, the company needs to start out by conducting an energy review. So a review could be basically, for instance, reviewing your energy bills uh, for the last 12 months, your consumption figures for all forms of energy used by the company, facilities, equipment, systems, and processes that have significant energy uses. Now, some examples of significant energy uses could be, for instance, in a light to medium industry, such as consumer, consumer electronics, home appliances, food processing. Uh, a significant energy use could be process heating, such as electricity, natural gas, coal, machine drive, such as pumps, fans, compressed air, steam systems, 
uh, building energy uses, um, for instance, lighting, HVAC, and hot water. Uh, in terms of a heavy industry, uh, such as uh, steel and metals, chemicals, industrial machinery, and so forth, an example of a significant energy use would be process heating, process cooling, machine drive, turbines, condensers, and steam systems. Uh, when it comes to buildings such as offices, retail, and warehouse, uh, an example of a significant energy use would be water heating, lighting, heating, and cooling systems, as well as pumping systems. Uh, building complexes such as healthcare facilities, educational campuses, municipalities, uh, some examples of significant energy use would be centralized and district heating and cooling systems, water heating, HVAC lighting, and compressed air, just to give you an example. Then uh, the company needs to establish an energy baseline. So they will look at uh, their historical energy consumption data, for instance, and they would select the year. For instance, they'll say, okay, I'm going to select 2016 as my baseline year. And then the objectives and targets that they would establish would be measured against the energy cons consumption of that particular baseline year. Now, some examples of an uh, energy objective or target could be an objective, objective could be improving transportation energy consumption. A corresponding target would be cutting uh, fuel consumption or reverting to another fuel source. Another example of an energy objective would be reducing facility energy costs. And a corresponding target uh, would be installing energy efficient lighting uh, or training staff when it comes to operational control, reporting, preventative and corrective action. Then uh, the company needs to develop an action plan. An example of an action plan might include a risk and opportunity register available within the organization to assess any future energy inefficiencies. Now, one thing that I want to talk about uh, and, uh, in a little bit more depth is the concept of continual energy performance improvement. That's one of the key requirements of ISO 50001. Now, some people, when they hear that, uh, they think that what that means is that a company needs to reduce their, uh, let's say, their energy consumption year over year, and then they turn around and say, well, that's kind of unrealistic. And it is, but that's not what it means. Continual energy performance improvement is that the company is continually striving to improve the energy management system. So in some years, for instance, the energy consumption could be flat, it could stagnate due to external uh, factors such as, let's say, it might have been a really hot summer outside the building or a really cold winter. But as long as the company, the organization, is able to demonstrate that they have taken steps in order to address that, and they've been trying to uh, continually improve the man energy management system, that's fine. They've met the requirement of the standard. The company then needs to develop an action plan. So some examples of an action plan, for instance, it could be uh, personnel responsible for the organization's energy consumptions have been trained properly to perform their tasks. There are preventative methods in place to ensure that the company does not deviate from the energy policy, targets, and objectives. The organization has a defined standard for operations and maintenance of installations, equipment, buildings, and facilities. Then they would need to uh, check the performance of the management system. Now here, um, energy performance indicators are required to provide a quantitative measure of energy performance and demonstrate continual improvement. They can be used to identify poor performance and utilize in nonconformities and preventative and corrective actions. Your, the organization has outlined its process of auditing, measuring, and targeting requirements of its energy management program. The organization has a process of handling nonconformance and suitably launching corrective and preventative action with an appropriate time limit and retaining all relevant documentation. And then lastly, they will need to monitor, document, and report all of the above so that the reviews are successful in identifying decisions and actions applicable to the improvement in the energy performance of the organization, changes to the policy, objectives, and targets, and allocation of resources. Here we're, gonna, we're looking at the ISO 50001 model. So the first step, as I mentioned before, is developing an energy policy. An energy policy identifies company commitment. 
Top management can provide top-level guidance and involvement in the setting of the energy policy, objectives, and targets. The organization has defined and documented standard procedures to ensure continual energy performance improvement. The procedural document states a responsibility to provide the necessary tools and resources required to meet goals and objectives. Then the company needs to develop an energy plan, which commits the organization to continual energy performance improvement. It also commits the company to comply with applicable laws, regulations, and other rules that will impact the organization's energy use. They would need to then implement uh, the plan, which defines the methodologies for achieving improvement. They will need to conduct monitoring and measurement to make sure that there is, they are basically not deviating from their objectives and targets that they've set. In case there has been any sort of deviation and nonconformities, they will need to take corrective actions in order to be able to address those nonconformities. They need to examine if there could have been any preventative actions that they could have taken and learn from that and implement it. They would need to conduct internal audits as well to identify improvement opportunities and then ultimately report back to management for review, uh, which will examine the energy management system and see if they've been able to meet their objectives and targets, and if not, what needs to be done to improve it and address those issues and ultimately be able to kind of get back on track to be able to meet the objectives and targets that the organization has set for their energy management system. So early adoption of ISO 50001 is yielding results. The U.S. Department of Energy have found that a structured energy management system yields greater, more cost-effective, and more sustainable energy savings than a more traditional project-based energy efficiency program. So the DOE, they've looked at the energy savings for companies that basically, and their business as usual, they've been able to have uh, energy savings. Uh, they've been about around about maybe 1% uh, per year. Industry leaders, you're looking at about 2.5% per year in terms of energy savings. However, those facilities that have adopted ISO 50001, they've been able to realize savings of over 4.5% per year. And the majority of it, around three quarters or 75% of those savings, have been from no to low cost operational improvements. The general rule is that if the plant's energy bill is greater than $1 million per year, then you can expect about a two year payback on the cost of the internal staff time, additional metering, and certification costs. If the plant's energy bill is greater than $3 million per year, then the payback is about a half a year or less. The U.S. Department of Energy is seeing, on average, uh, about 4.5% annual energy savings improvement, even from facilities with mature energy management programs. Most of the 4.5% savings is from operational improvement, again, even for more mature facilities. The energy management system, it squeezes out additional savings at low cost. Uh, looking at some uh, business case studies in Canada, so basically Canadian industrial companies that have implemented 50,001, they've been able to achieve an average cumulative energy performance improvement of almost 10% within the first two years. And energy management systems have had the potential to save up to 30% uh, total energy use for the industrial sector and up for up to 40% uh, in the commercial building sector. Chrysler, they have a facility in Brampton, Ontario, close to Toronto, and that facility has been able to gain energy savings that have exceeded $2 million since 2013. That facility has adopted ISO 50001 and they've become certified to it as well. IBM has a facility in Quebec that's been able to uh, cut their energy consumption by over 9% and save $550,000 in one year alone. Lincoln Electric, uh, they were able to realize energy savings of 22% in one year alone. 3M, they have a facility in Brockville, Ontario, uh, which is uh, close to the Quebec border, and that facility has been able to realize $350,000 in energy savings within a two-year time span. In the U.S., the U.S. Department of Energy, they've conducted an analysis and they've examined 10 facilities that are certified to 50,001. And as you can see, the cost savings per year 
the range from 36,000 to close to $940,000 per year. And they've uh, realized 12% reduction in energy costs on average within the uh, 15 months of uh, initial implementation. And there's been over $430,000 in savings each year from, again, low to no cost operational improvements. And here is just a, some example of some facilities in the U.S. and in Canada. And you can see the energy performance improvement that they've been able to realize typically within a three-year time span. On the international scene, ISO 50001, um, basically for many new product sustainability standards, uh, they're including 50001 as an optional cr criteria to meet the requirements of the standards, and those are just some standards that are uh, listed there. There is a global organization called the Clean Energy Ministerial, and the goal and objective of this organization is to help encourage industry to adopt 50001. Uh, and uh, on their site, um, there's numerous business case studies listed on there that uh, from different business uh, uh, sectors and industries from across the world that have adopted and have uh, even become certified to 50,001. And in these big business case studies, it lists basically how much energy they were able to save in terms of consumption, in terms of energy costs, as well as in terms of reduction in their emissions. So there's some really uh, useful and insightful business case studies on their site. Uh, there is ISO 50001 Implementation of Financial Assistance. In Canada, uh, Natural Resources Canada, they will provide financial assistance of up to 50% of eligible costs to a maximum of $40,000 per site for commercial, industrial, and institutional facilities. The maximum limit is $200,000 per project or per company. So if a company has multiple sites, each site is eligible to receive up to $40,000, but for the organization as a whole, the maximum limit is $200,000. Some of the eligible costs include uh, hiring a consultant if a company decides to hire an external, external consultant to help them implement uh, the standard. That's one of the eligible costs, as well as initial certification fees uh, for 50,001 if a company decides to become certified to, uh, to the standard. Uh, in British Columbia, the BC Ministry of Energy and Mines and Natural Resources Canada have joined together to offer up to $80,000 of cost share assistance to BC industrial companies. In the U.S., uh, while the U.S. Department of Energy, they don't offer uh, financial assistance, they do offer a free online software tool called ISO 50001 Ready Navigator. That's basically a step-by-step -step guide that helps companies implement the requirements of the 50001 standard. It's very easy to use, very straightforward, and very beneficial, so that it just walks the companies uh, through what they need to do in terms of implementing the standard. It's also open to non-U.S. based companies, so they can use it as well. And it comes in three different languages, English, French, and Spanish, and the link is provided on the site, on this slide here. So if a company decides to become ISO uh, 50001 ready recognized, meaning that they've uh, just implemented the standard, uh, but they haven't become certified to it, they can do so and they can receive recognition from the U.S. Department of Energy. What they need to do is first they need to implement the 50001 principles, complete the 25 tasks in the ISO 50001 Ready Navigator software tool. Uh, then they will need to present their energy performance and submit that to the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, they will need to self-attest to 50001 uh, Ready, and then uh, they will receive uh, a certificate of re recognition uh, from the U.S. DOE. ISO, uh, it publishes a booklet called A Practical Guide for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises that basically explains in very simple and straightforward language what the requirements of each clause is in the standard and how particularly small and medium-sized companies can go about implementing a standard. It's something that I would highly recommend uh, for those companies that have uh, very little to no exposure to, to ISO standards. It can really help them guide them through that uh, path. Uh, you can go and purchase this online on ISO's website. Um, it comes in digital as well as hard copies, and it costs about um, it costs about fifty dollars Canadian if you decide to purchase it. 
Now, some companies, they implement and then they decide to become, um, seek third-party certification. And the benefits of a third-party certification is that those facilities that do become certified to 50,001, uh, whereas, uh, where the, the, a third-party auditor comes in once a year and audits the system and then they receive third-party uh, recognition and certification for it, is that those facilities, they recognize, um, sorry, I should say, they realize a higher energy performance improvement compared to those facilities that are not certified to them and may have just simply adopted it. And this graph illustrates that point. So if we look at the year 2015, uh, which is the latest data, the green line are Schneider Electric facilities that are certified to 50,001. So on average, they've been able to uh, realize energy performance improvements of about 19%. The blue line represents Schneider Electric facilities uh, that are not uh, certified to 50,001, and they've been able to uh, gain, uh, achieve about 11.5% of energy performance improvement. Uh, in case of 3M, the yellow line represents those facilities that are certified. So as you can see in 2015, uh, you're looking at about 10.5% improvement. The orange line, it depicts those uh, facilities that are not certified to 50,001, and they've been able to realize about 6.5% improvement. So in terms of uh, 3M, uh, those facilities that are certified, they've been able to achieve uh, approximately 62% greater say, uh, improvements over three years. And for the Schneider facilities that are certified, they've been able to achieve 65% uh, uh, greater improvement over uh, four years versus those sites uh, that are not certified. So uh, this uh, uh, basically illustrates the benefit of third-party certification. And the reason for that is because each year you have an auditor coming, checking, and ensuring that your management system is working as it's intended to work. And they can also provide opportunities for improvement as well, uh, which uh, is included in the audit report. Each year, ISO publishes the ISO survey that basically states the number of certifications globally for all the major standards, such as ISO 9001, 14001, et cetera. And in this graph, we see the total number of ISO 50001 certifications globally. 50001 was first published back in 2011. As, as you can see, there's been a considerable um, adoption, and, and I should say certification to 50001 uh, in the past uh, eight years. So in 2017, there's over 21,000 organizations globally that are certified to uh, 50001. In North, North America, uh, and by North America, I mean US, Mexico, and Canada combined, the numbers are far less. Uh, in 2017, about 127 organizations were certified to 50,001. However, there has also been an increase in the number of uh, companies that have decided to become certified to it. And I think it just speaks to uh, what I spoke earlier uh, regarding rising energy costs and the volatility that we're seeing in energy markets. Deloitte of London, uh, they're an insurance company based in the UK, and uh, back in 2010, they published a report called uh, Sustainable Energy Security. And in that report, they stated, businesses which prepare for and take advantage of the new energy reality will prosper. Failure to do so could be catastrophic. So again, in, in this uh, day and age where we have uh, rising energy costs, uh, energy fluctuation, volatility, I think it's imperative for organizations to pay closer attention to their energy performance, to their consumption, efficiency, and how they can conserve energy. And ISO 50001 can definitely play a role in terms of how, helping them uh, achieve those uh, goals and objectives. So my uh, contact information is listed there, and um, that concludes uh, the presentation. Thank you. Fred, thank you. Go ahead and you can put your um, information back up there in case people want to capture that. And we're also going to be providing 
um, a copy of the slides with the replay link um, a little bit later on today. So you folks will have all those wonderful links that Fred shared in his presentation. Great information. I'm really excited to learn more about 50,001 as well. So Fred, we do have a few questions. And um, just a reminder to all of you, if you have questions for Fred, you can go ahead and type those into the chat or the Q&A. Um, and we've got plenty of time to answer all of your questions, hopefully, um, this afternoon. So Fred, one of the questions that Faribault asked was about the registrars. Um, if, uh, you know, how many registrars or if all registrars currently have lead auditors that are prepared to audit to the 50,001 standard? Uh, yeah, I can't really speak to that. I'm not really uh, sure uh, regarding other registrars. Uh, we do have auditors on staff. Uh, we are prepared and we have received our ANAB accreditation to conduct mm -hmm. third party uh, certification for uh, ISO 50001. But regarding the other uh, uh, auditing firms and certification bodies, unfortunately, I can't really speak to that one. I'm not aware. Okay. Yeah, I would assume with it, um, with the standard having been around since 2011, probably some of the larger registrars out there, um, you know, certainly are offering this, this registration. Um, Fred, I had a question as well. If you could back up to your slide where you were showing the number of certifications globally and um, pause on the North American one before you go back to the global one, because I just want to make sure that this sinks in for folks. Um, yeah, so okay, so go forward just one. So for North America, which a lot of us are in North America, if you could just go, yeah, 127 certifications in 2017. Now go back to your global one, 127 out of 21,500. So my question to you, Fred, is where are all these certifications? Are they in Europe? Are they in yeah. Asia? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, great question. And I want to speak to it, I forgot, but uh, thanks for bringing this up. It's definitely uh, dri uh, driven uh, by Europe, uh, the number one country uh -huh. being Germany, followed by the UK. Oh. So as you can see, wow. there is a, a significant difference between Europe and North America. Uh, but in North America, it's, uh, I think there, there is a, 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 like a, a slow momentum that's building here, and there's more um, uh, companies, organizations, and just people in general who work in, uh, who are responsible for energy management basically uh, realizing and learning about ISO 50001 and, and the benefits that are there. And also the government support that's here too. Um, you know, as I, discussed, as I mentioned, uh, the federal government, both in the U.S. and Canada, they're really encouraging uh, organizations to embrace and adopt 50001, and they're offering those in incentives. Definitely, yeah. And I will say, you know, anecdotally myself, I have recognized a number of organizations, um, larger organizations, even in the automotive supply chain, that are looking at 50,001 um, and considering certification for their organizations. But having said that, and it's interesting that you mentioned Europe was kind of like where the majority of these certifications lie. We saw this same trend with 14,001 in environmental management probably about two decades ago now. Um, it, so 14,001, a lot of organizations address energy usage from an environmental perspective. Fred, can you share with us a little bit about what um, overlap, if any, exists between the 14,001 standard and the ISO 50,001 on energy management? Right, yeah. So the key distinction between ISO 14,001 and 50,001 is that uh, concept of continual energy performance improvement. That's very okay. unique to ISO 50,001, and that's one of the key requirements of ISO 50001 that doesn't exist in 14001. So a company needs to continuously demonstrate that they're uh, striving to perform, to improve the energy management system that they have. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that kind of leads to another question. I think you may have mentioned it in one of your slides that um, even though there's the requirement for continual improvement or continual reduction, um, that's, or that's not necessarily meaning that year over year there's got to be a measured improvement or reduction exactly. of energy usage. Exactly. Right, uh, right. Okay. Some people assume that what that uh, implies or what that means is you need to continually reduce, let's say, your energy consumption year over year. Well, frankly, that's a little right. bit unrealistic. So it's not talking about energy consumption. It's talking about your energy management system improvement, so improving the system that you have. and. Um, so for instance, some years, uh, you may not be able to achieve the target that you set for yourself. 
So for instance, you might, your target might be reducing my energy consumption by 1% a year. Some okay. years you may not be able to achieve that. But as long as you can demonstrate, and you may not be able to achieve it, as I said, for instance, because of factors that are just beyond the organization's control, like uh, outside temperature, uh, right. the temperature <laughs> outside your facility. But as long as you strive to do that and strive to hit your targets that you set uh, and you can demonstrate that, then that's fine. So what would be some examples of continual improvement that an organization might demonstrate despite not necessarily showing a net reduction in energy management or energy usage? So it could be, for instance, studying, uh, conducting any sort of uh, studies as to how they can able to achieve those targets, even if they weren't able to do mm -hmm. so. So conducting feasibility okay. studies, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So they're taking proactive stance in order to be able to achieve the targets that they've established. So for instance, if they were going to introduce a new piece of equipment, establishing exactly. kind of an energy budget for that equipment would be an right. example. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Okay, cool. Very good. Um, tell us a little bit more about the certification side in terms of what the certification process looks like, and specifically, I think a question that's probably on a lot of people's minds is, how are the number of registrar on-site audit days calculated? Because typically we find that that's based on, like, the number of people that work inside of an organization for ISO 9001. Right, right. So um, ISO 50001, there's also a unique feature uh, regarding the standard. And the, the basically the number, the way that the um, audit duration or the amount of time that's required to audit a company, it's really based on four factors. And there is a formula that's involved with it. I'm not going to go too much into it, but the, the four key factors are uh, the company's annual energy consumption, excuse me, it's a measured in joules. Uh, their mm -hmm. uh, energy uh, sources, so that could be, uh, let's say, uh, natural gas, electricity, diesel. Uh, then it's their significant energy use, which I talked about. So it could be their air compressors, HVAC, lighting, and so forth. And then the number of effective personnel or the number of effective employees. And what that means is how many people in the organizations are directly responsible for managing the energy management system. So it's not based on the total headcount or the total number of employees at that organization, but rather just based on the number of effective employees. So um, okay. for instance, let's say um, an organization, a company can have 500 employees but there's only five employees that are directly involved uh, in terms of managing the, uh, uh, the, the energy uh, uh, management system at the company. Well, then the mm -hmm. audit duration is calculated based on those five employees. So that can re uh, uh, dramatically and significantly reduce the amount of time that's required to audit the company as well as the cost of the audit and certification itself. So what, what does, like, an audit for 500 person, you know, five person effective employees, how many days would that be, just to give people an idea? Uh, what yeah, that that's, looks like. you know, it's kind of difficult to say. I mean, I mean, just a rough ballpark figure. Um, that could range for the initial certification uh, between five to $10,000 just for the first year when they become certified no, I guess for I was the first time. Yeah, how, how many um, audit man days, like how many days of um, auditing would the registrar perform on site? Oh, yeah, that could be about day. maybe two to three days. Okay, all right, so it's typical to what we might see like in an ISO 9001 or even ISO 14001, exactly, maybe but, a little bit yeah, less. As I mentioned, it's a little bit more complicated because it really depends on those four factors, and there is a, yeah. a formula that's used to, to calculate the amount of time that's required to conduct the audit. Uh, okay, excellent, excellent. Um, Fred, another question along the lines about the certification that came in is um, if you're a multi-site organization, so I'm assuming 3M and Schneider Electric, who you shared some of the case study information, they sound like they're multi-site organizations. Um, how does certification work in that case? Because I know with ISO 9001, ISO 14001, you can do kind of a corporate uh, certification scheme but each of the sites initially has to be audited, um, you know, so how does that work with 50,001? If you're so a multi -site? if it's a multi-site, so if an organization has multiple sites, um, we do sampling. So meaning that mm -hmm. 
we don't audit, uh, the auditor doesn't go into every single site and conduct an on-site audit. They sample, they select which sites they, uh, they will uh, go and actually conduct an on-site audit. And, and there is actually a formula for it. It's very straightforward. It's just the square root of the total number of sites. So having said that, for instance, let's say um, a company has four sites, square root of four is two. So the auditor will only go and conduct uh, the on-site audit at, at two of the sites, not all four. Ah, okay. So, so in these, is that even for the initial certification? If they only go to the two sites, or do they have to visit That's correct. all it's four? That's correct. It's for all cycles. Ah. So for initial certification, surveillance audit, as well as recertification. Ah, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Um, so I have another question that came up is about the impact, um, and, and I wanted to get your perspective. You were sharing those staggering statistics with us um, from 3M and Schneider Electric that the difference between their sites that are 50,001 certified and those that aren't is on the order of magnitude of 60% in terms of their energy savings. What do you believe is attributed to that kind of result? Because that's, that's phenomenal. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's really because each year you have an auditor coming in, so really the company needs to stay on top of their energy management system because you have a third party mm. external auditor coming and verifying to see that you are meeting the requirements and conforming to the requirements of the standard, particularly in terms of trying to reach your objectives and targets. Uh, particularly in terms of that continual energy management system improvement. And in, mm -hmm. in addition, uh, the auditor will come and they will provide opportunities for improvement as well, which will be included in the audit report. So you have, you have a, a fresh set of eyes coming once a year, and an external set of eyes, I should say, and they, they review and, and uh, 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 check your performance. So it embeds a much higher uh, degree of uh, persistence, commitment, and discipline in uh, managing your energy uh, performance. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought this slide back up to show the actual split because you can see over the course of the years, you know, how, how the ISO 50001 sites um, start really kind of taking off in terms of their energy improvements or energy savings compared to the non-certified sites here. So you can see that that tends to grow over time. That's excellent. Right. Absolutely. So in terms in terms of the auditors, because I'm sure we've got some folks online here who are avid auditors as well, I bet they're wondering what type of background um, experience qualifications, excuse me, does a third party auditor who would do a 50,001 audit need to have? So uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, if um, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, they do list on their website, and I don't have the, the link for me, but if, if, um, you know, if you're interested, you can go online on their site and then do a search for ISO 50001 lead auditor. Um, and there is a link there that kind of states the courses that they would need to take and basically what the process is for them to become um, a designated uh, lead auditor for 50001. Uh, it's on okay. the U.S. Department of Energy's website, and it explains the process there. Okay, excellent, excellent. And I also find it very interesting, you mentioned, of course, the U.S. Department of Energy and also um, its, its kin up there in Canada, um, that these government agencies, if you will, are so um, supportive of this, these, this ISO 50001 standard. I think we kind of see that a little bit with the EPA and ISO 14001, OSHA and ISO 45001, but not, um, I'm, I'm sensing that um, the, like the Department of Energy is very actively promoting the use of ISO 50001. Could you comment Absolutely. to that? Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Uh, they're very much promoting it, and I think uh, uh, that, that uh, software tool that they have, the ISO 50001 Ready Navigator, is a fantastic tool. It's very easy to use, very straightforward, and it basically walks an organization through. It's a step-by-step -step guide as to what they need to do in order to implement um, all the requirements of the standard. 
So okay, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic tool. It's free. It's online, and uh, and yeah. So I think that uh, really uh, points to the fact that uh, the governments, uh, especially at the federal level, they're really encouraging the industrial, commercial, institutional sectors to explore and ultimately adopt 50001 in their practices and their operations. That's awesome. Yeah. Fred, could you go back to the slide where you talk about the, the Ready um, 50001 and Roberto had a question, you know, the Ready Navigator. Um, Roberto's question was, um, if you get two certificates when you do 50001, in other words, because um, I think it said something about that you could self-declare, maybe it's on your next slide. Oh, this talk, yeah, yeah. This, this certificate. So I think Roberto was asking, do you get like a third party certification certificate from the registrar and then also this US DOE certificate? So uh, the US DOE certificate, it's, um, it's only if a company uh, implements it and self-attests to uh, the standard. So Got it. you uh, don't have to do this in order. It's not, it's not it. a so, third party certification. Yeah. Got it. So, so a company could choose, I'm going to implement 50,001, but I don't want to, at this time, let's say, invest in third party certification. So I'm going to self declare. And this DOE, right. um, this ready site is, um, 50,001 ready site is right. how you would right. demonstrate that. Absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, so, so Roberto, I think to your question, you don't have to do the 50,001 ready, you know, if you just wanted to go straight to a certification body and get a 50,001 certified, then you'd get a formal certificate. But this looks like a different, you know, another option, so to speak, for organizations that um, may not at this time choose to invest in that certification. Right. So, uh, yeah. Having said that, uh, perhaps uh, uh, some companies, they choose to use that ISO 50001 Ready Navigator and to help them, as I mentioned, implement the standard, and then they apply for the 50001 Ready Recognition from the U.S. Department of Energy, which is a self-attestation or self-declaration. But then when they do that, that's when they might feel comfortable saying, okay, I think we're now actually ready for a third-party certification. Mm, yeah, so this is almost like a great on-ramp then to prepare exactly. an organization to That's be right. successful. That's right, prepare them for, yeah, uh, for like a third-party audit and certification. Yeah, excellent. So I have another question, um, Fred, I think you and I may have spoken about this previously, but are there organizations, and I'm really thinking about small companies here that like they don't have an energy person. <laughs> they're, they're kind of like if, if you go into their organization, their um, environmental, occupational health and safety person is maybe also their HR person or maybe they're kind of outsourcing to a company that just comes and, you know, takes care of all of their reporting, you know, that they have to do back to um, OSHA or EPA. Are there certain size organizations that, um, you know, just wouldn't gain anything from 50,001? Or does, is there benefit for all, all size organizations? So definitely, uh, I would say there is, uh, uh, the main benefit will be for the energy in intensive sectors and industries mm, and for okay. larger consumers. Uh, having said that, though, uh, for instance, this uh, practical guide that ISO itself publishes, a practical guide for small and medium-sized enterprises, it does mention that there are benefits right now also for, you know, small and medium-sized companies as well. Uh, but, yeah, it's typically the, the larger organizations, the energy-intensive sectors uh, that usually uh, go uh, for um, uh, ISO adoption and implementation. Mm -hmm. So, so besides, let's say, maybe a lower electric bill for a smaller organization, what would you see maybe could be some other benefits for a smaller organization to adopt 50,001? Uh, probably uh, it'll be uh, really just uh, preparing themselves and uh, for and, and mitigating their business against, uh, you know, fluctuating energy prices. So it can be electricity, mm. natural gas oil, um, and then also, uh, you know, if, if they do uh, uh, emit greenhouse gases, that could be also another one as well. Uh, yeah. But uh, more so, I would say definitely in terms of reducing their energy consumption, uh, any form of consumption could be electricity, natural gas, diesel, and so forth, and, and ultimately their energy costs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, regardless of the size of the organization, I'm seeing a number of industry sectors 
really kind of grabbing hold of this idea of corporate responsibility and sustainability. And no doubt one element of that is energy consumption or energy usage. So even if you're a smaller organization, you might even find that some of your customers are aligning those corporate responsibility sustainability requirements down their supply chain and expect you to at least have some visibility and management around your energy usage. So. Right, absolutely. right, absolutely. And one uh, thing I want to add, too, is that especially for companies that already are certified to ISO 9001 and in particular 14001, uh, Integrating 50,001 with their existing ISO uh, certification is is much simpler uh, because of the Excellent. fact that both are uh, based on that Annex SL structure. So 50,001 becomes a lot simpler for uh, organizations that are uh, you know they have experience and they have had exposure working with ISO management systems. They've implemented and are, might might even be certified to it. So 50,001 uh, can complement uh, those management systems quite well too. Excellent. Yeah, and that's actually what I've started to see in some of the larger manufacturers here in the U.S. that they are looking to, um, let's say, expand on their energy portion of their environmental management system by bringing in ISO 50001 and just kind of connecting that, you know, expanding that topic of their environmental management system as well. So, right, absolutely. Uh, so, so are there any other questions from our audience out there? Um, had some great questions uh, coming in. Um, and uh, if not, um, yeah, so Fred, maybe if you would just like to share some, some parting thoughts for us um, to motivate us to pursue ISO 50001, and then we'll wrap up today's session. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, uh, essentially, I think, uh, as I mentioned, ISO 50001 is just starting to uh, uh, grab a, a foothold here in North America. And uh, it's not as widely known or recognized as the other ISO standards, such as 9001 and 14001. Uh, but I think it's definitely a tool and, um, that uh, organizations should uh, explore and consider in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, preparing their business for the energy reality that we're living right now, and uh, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, rising energy costs, uh, fluctuating energy costs, which I'm sure a lot of us have, uh, uh, you know, we've uh, uh, witnessed in the past couple of years and we've seen. And uh, there's also additional uh, uh, regulatory requirements that are kind of coming online, and, um, you know, some organizations need to comply with those. And that kind of depends on the jurisdiction, but still. And of course, there's um, organizational uh, brand and reputation. So ISO 50001 can really help with that. And I think uh, uh, the incentives that uh, the government is providing, which I talked about, I think that's a sign as well that uh, it's something that, uh, you know, uh, institutions, organizations, they need to pay closer attention to. And the government is there to support them and help them. And, uh, and yeah, so it's definitely a, a tool and a means to take into consideration. Yeah, and thank you, Mike. I saw your question about the incentives for the U.S. government. I think, Fred, you shared with us that in Canada, they um, actually provide some financial assistance. Um, I think you mentioned that here in the U.S., they're not providing the financial assistance, but we've got that 50,000 ready tool that's available. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But you never know at some point, you know, if there's, if there's enough interest in the 50,001, we can uh, maybe petition Washington to give us the money. <laughs> <laughs> but it, just, it just depends on the government. <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you so much, Fred. This was an awesome presentation. I'm really excited about 50,001, and uh, I personally plan on going out and encouraging a lot more organizations, even the small ones, to take a look at this because I think there can certainly be benefit in um, not just from the, the bottom line in their cost to the organization, but definitely aligning with the expectations of their, their industry partners in the supply chain and also preparing themselves. I kind of like that idea. We've talked a lot about risk and risk management in the ISO standards, and this is definitely a tool I can see that would help organizations manage those risks of fluctuating 
um, you know, energy costs as well. So, so just a reminder to everyone. Um, yeah, this is uh, a thank you, Jason. Jason was saying that uh, it's helpful to start to learn more. And uh, yes, Jason, I hope your organization pursues ISO 50001. You can get a hold of Fred and his organization will be glad to talk with you further about that as well. So a couple of closing items. Um, if you folks have any other questions and follow up from today's presentation, you can just go ahead and post those either here in the chat Q&A or you can email them to the QMD um, uh, email address. I think you folks have that already. Um, you will also be receiving an email within 24 hours that has the link to the replay, um, your R user or CEUs as we like to call them. Um, and um, also will include Fred's contact information in case you'd like to reach out to him directly with any, um, any other questions. So I thank you all so much for joining us. And Fred, thank you for sharing your expertise on ISO 50001 with us today. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend and hope to see you again soon in a future QMD EED webinar. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having me.